My name is James Blair. I work at Red Hat in the office of the CTO, but I'm not here today to talk about anything in particular to Red Hat. I'm here uh, as a representative of an upstream open source community um, working on a project that we call OpenDev. And OpenDev is a new project. It's, uh, you might not have heard of it, and that's understandable. I think this is actually the first conference presentation we've ever given uh, about OpenDev. Um, it is the software development environment that we created for OpenStack. OpenStack is uh, the third most active free software project in the world right now. Uh, Chromium and the Linux kernel are the other two. It's, in terms of the number of changes, the number of developers, the, the rate of development, it's uh, a very busy project, and uh, we use a number of specialized tools for that. And underneath those tools, we have some, uh, some interesting systems running them. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. OpenDev is also something that we've we've sort of earnestly been working on uh, after we uh, attended this talk by Benjamin Mako Hill called Free Software Needs Free Tools. And it's something that we believe very strongly in. Uh, so as an open source project ourselves in, in OpenStack, we felt that we needed to be using free software to develop that. And so everything that we do uh, in the development of OpenStack and even in the operation of the systems that we use to do that development is all free software. And I'm very happy about that. So the OpenDev service is, uh, is centered around Garrett for code review. Uh, so instead of using GitHub or GitLab or any other of the uh, any other popular code review systems, uh, we use Garrett. That's also something, incidentally, that the Chromium project uses and Android and, and several other large open source projects. Um, that's the main interface that developers have when they're developing on the project. That's where they push up their changes, where they review changes from other developers. We use a system called Zool uh, for continuous integration and continuous deployment. That's also something that we developed for OpenStack and is uh, gaining more widespread use. And uh, finally, the focus of this talk is actually on a tool called Gitty, which uh, is what we use for code hosting. It's what, uh, what we use for browsing the source code on the web. It's what, uh, if you perform a Git clone of an open source, uh, sorry, excuse me, an OpenStack project, that's gonna come from the Git servers. So uh, it's one of our larger systems. It's uh, uh, currently a farm of eight virtual machines handling, uh, handling this workload. And um, that's, that's the piece of software that we wanna put on Ceph. So the Git service, uh, as when we started it out with OpenDev, uh, like I said, is on eight virtual machines. Those virtual machines are uh, completely standalone right now. They're all independent of each other, which is annoying for scaling. It means it's difficult to, to, to scale them up. We need to, to add another one, add it to the load balancer, add each one as a replication target from Garrett. Um, it's, it's not the sort of thing that we want to be doing for such a large service. So what we want to do is we want to get to a point where every part of this system is highly available uh, and, uh, and shared everything so that, uh, so that we can have a single instance of Gitty. And when Garrett is replicating to that, it, it only knows about one system. When, uh, when people are browsing or cloning, they, they're, they're only hitting... Uh, one system. So in order to do that, we need to, to move, I think it's raining. I think that's what that is. Um, so we need to move from our shared nothing model to shared everything. So first we're gonna need a shared file system for our Git repositories. That's where Ceph, uh, CephFS comes in. We're gonna need a database for, uh, because Git needs a, a database in order to keep track of users and uh, the names of Git repositories and issues and things like that. We're gonna use the Percona Extra DB for that. That's also, uh, that's essentially a, a multi-master um, MySQL system. Uh, 
So again, we're, we're dealing with a shared environment. And eventually, we're going to have an Elasticsearch cluster. And this is actually the thing that's keeping this system from going into production right now. Um, the Elasticsearch backend for, for Gitty for doing full text indexing on issues and code isn't quite ready yet. But as soon as, as it is, we'll have shared everything for this system, and, uh, and we'll be able to go into production. And we're going to run all of these things in Kubernetes, because Kubernetes makes managing um, shared systems like this uh, quite simple. Now, the first thing that we need to do before we bring up a system like this is to get a Kubernetes. And because of where we come from, uh, as part of the OpenStack project, we have a number of OpenStack clouds available to us. Um, that's, we're going to use that to set up our, our Kubernetes cluster. And there are a number of uh, advantages to that. It's going to be helpful uh, in the use of Rook and Ceph, because as, as it turns out, they, they make some requirements on specific kernel versions um, and some extra devices that we're going to need. So running our own Kubernetes on top of OpenStack is, is going to be helpful uh, for that. We're going to be able to use um, multiple vendors for this. So we can, we're going to deploy it on one vendor, but we currently, our production systems actually span eight different public and private OpenStack clouds. And so if needed, we can move, uh, expand our system into others of those or, or move between them as needed. We're, it's the running systems in a multi-cloud environment is actually really interesting. We've, we see our failure domain as the cloud, not as individual virtual machines. So it's, uh, it's really exciting to be able to design systems around that. Uh, OpenStack provides a number of services that we're going to be able to use. Uh, they're going to plug right into Kubernetes. We're going to be able to use uh, load balancers, block storage, and virtual machines all uh, transparently behind the scenes here. And finally, uh, this stack is free software all the way down. So from the services that we run on top of it through Kubernetes, through OpenStack, to the underlying cloud provider, uh, it's free software all the way. So it uh, gives us a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling uh, as far as being part of the community goes. The OpenStack integration with Kubernetes is, uh, we found to be very convenient. And we're going to use a couple of points uh, of that integration here. There, there are others. But we're going to focus on using the, the sender driver, which will provide back-end volumes for Kubernetes. We're going to use that later when we provision that Percona database. Uh, it's going to use uh, native Kubernetes volumes, and Kubernetes is going to get those volumes from OpenStack's sender driver. We're also going to be able to use those sender volumes for, uh, for Ceph, but in a somewhat roundabout way. Instead of going directly through Kubernetes, we're going to have those volumes attached to our underlying Kubernetes uh, minions. Uh, we're also going to use the Octavia load balancer to provide ingress into the system. So Rook. Rook is uh, an operator for Ceph, for Kubernetes. Um, it, uh, well, I say it's for Ceph, but it's for many other things as well. And actually, there are several talks here uh, at Cephalicon about other uh, backends, uh, other things that Rook can do other than Ceph. But it was originally created for Ceph, and that's, uh, that's what we're going to use it for. The 1.0 version has uh, beta support for the container storage interface, which is going to change a lot of this. Um, but we're targeting the, the flex volume driver, sorry, the flex storage driver uh, for Kubernetes, which is uh, a little more battle tested. Uh, and it works in the slightly older version of Kubernetes that, uh, that we're using. And uh, to get started, we need a way to deploy Kubernetes. And I don't want to do that. Um, myself. Uh, in fact, really, the underlying theme of this talk is how to, how to use automation that other people have made for you uh, so that you can do all of this stuff with very little effort. Uh, there's a project called Kubernetes on OpenStack, which is exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, it's essentially a, a series of Ansible playbooks which will deploy Kubernetes on an OpenStack uh, for you. And it will 
configure Kubernetes to do all of these integrations with OpenStack that I'm talking about. So when it's done, it'll, it'll already be configured uh, with the Cinder volume driver and the Octavia load balancer and, and things like that. So to get started, um, all you need to do is set up some environment variables and then run the Ansible playbook. So this is, uh, these are our environment variables that we use for the OpenDev Kubernetes cluster. And uh, there's a bunch of boring stuff in there. The interesting things are at the top, where you name your cluster. You can use this, uh, these playbooks to manage any number of clusters. So we, we call ours OpenDev Kubernetes. Um, there's some boring stuff in the middle about versions and configuring things for your environment. And then at the bottom, um, there's, uh, there are some things that are of interest to our particular deployment. Uh, for instance, we're going to use Octavia. Uh, uh, we're going to use uh, the block storage device. And, um, and there's some things about extra volumes uh, in there, which I'll get to in a minute. So uh, once you've set those environment variables up, uh, you can just run the Ansible playbooks uh, like so. So we source our environment variables, we run Ansible playbook, uh, and then it gets started. So uh, this is a recording of an actual terminal session that I used to, to uh, bootstrap this cluster. And it's sped up a little bit, so we're not going to be sitting here forever. I think the actual run takes about 15 minutes. Um, so it's long enough to go get a cup of coffee and come back, and then you've got a Kubernetes there. Uh, but you can see what it's doing now is it's setting up uh, all of the requirements in, in the OpenStack cluster. So you've got uh, security groups, setting up SSH keys. It's currently booting the Kubernetes master. Um, and now it's starting to bring up the nodes. Uh, our cluster is going to have one master and three Kubernetes minion nodes. Um, so it'll, uh, it'll start to configure those now. Um, and like I said, once, once it brings up those nodes, it's going to do all of the, the things necessary to bootstrap your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the cluster is going to be configured to talk to the OpenStack that it's, uh, that it's booting on. So uh, back in those environment variables, I gave it the, the, the credentials to log in into an OpenStack and create the virtual machines, right? So the, the playbook is creating those virtual machines now and running things on it. But additionally, it'll use those credentials and, and add them into the, the Kubernetes plugins that, uh, that interface with OpenStack and, uh, and allow it to, to use Sender as a, as a volume driver and Octavia as the ingress controller and, and things like that. Uh, so we're just about finished now. It's uh, setting up the cube config file. Uh, and setting up so that we can run cube control. And it is done. So you can see at the end, uh, we've got our minion, our, uh, excuse me, our master, our three minions, uh, and they're, uh, they're all set up. Um, you can log in uh, to any of these machines as root. As part of the configuration, you, you give it uh, your SSH keys. Uh, so you can log in as root to any of these machines. And in case something goes wrong, you can you can see the logs there. It configures the system to use uh, journal D for logging. So you can, uh, you can see the logs from any of the Kubernetes processes using uh, journal control. Uh, and uh, it writes out a kube control config file. And you can run kubectl to, uh, to examine uh, the Kubernetes cluster. So basically, with just by setting up those environment variables and running that playbook, we've got a Kubernetes. Uh, up and running. So uh, with that, you can, uh, you can use the standard OpenStack commands. Uh, for instance, here's a listing of the servers. So you can see that uh, uh, our, th our four servers show up um, as normal OpenStack servers. So anything that you can, you can do to manage OpenStack virtual machines, uh, you can do so here. Uh, it 
writes out a, a cube control config file into the directory as admin.conf. So if you copy that into place, then you can run your standard kubectl commands to, uh, to inspect the cluster and, and see what's going on. So now that we have this cluster up and running, we want to run Rook on it. Um, in order to do that, Rook and Ceph are going to need some storage. So one of the variables that I snuck into the middle of that uh, configuration stanza from earlier. Um, some of those variables are about uh, setting up extra volumes. So what this does is this tells Kubernetes on OpenStack that whenever it creates uh, a minion, it should add an extra volume onto that server. Uh, so we're, we're asking it for an 80 gig volume. So each of our three minions has an extra volume attached to it. It's not currently being used by Kubernetes. It's not, uh, it's not formatted or mounted or anything. It's just a, block a raw block device that shows up as dev um, VDB. And it's sitting there, and later on, Rook is going to be able to find that. Running Rook is essentially a three-step process. Uh, first, you set up the common uh, Kubernetes objects that are used by the system later on. Then you create the operator. Uh, and then once the operator exists, you can create one or more clusters. You can, you can have as many uh, Ceph clusters as you want managed by Rook. Um, we're just going to, to set up one here. The Rook operator handles all the fussy parts of bringing up and managing a Ceph cluster. So I don't have, uh, I don't have years of experience with Ceph. I came to Ceph via Rook. Um, my experience has been very good with Rook, uh, and, and I like it because, uh, because it helps me get a Ceph cluster up and running fairly quickly. Once it's up and running, that doesn't absolve you of responsibility for learning about Ceph. Uh, you're still going to need to learn uh, how it works under the hood, uh, but uh, it's a great way to get started and get things up and running and, uh, and get things uh, managed uh, pretty quickly. So uh, the, the operator handles things like bringing up the cluster or expanding the cluster if you add new storage devices or minions, uh, which is something that we can do here with the Kubernetes on OpenStack system. Uh, if we want to add more minions, uh, we can just go back to the, the variables that we use to configure it. Instead of telling it three minions, we could tell it six or eight or whatever, run it again, and it'll uh, create new minions, add storage to them, add them to the Kubernetes cluster. And then the, the Rook operator is going to be able to uh, notice that new storage and add it into the Ceph cluster. So it handles a lot of, that, uh, a lot of the operations for us. Our Ceph cluster is going to be a little bit special, though. So rather than uh, your first experience with Rook will probably be to copy and paste the three commands from the readme uh, into, into your terminal uh, with your Kubernetes, and, and that will probably work for you, and it will be great. We actually do need to do a little bit more uh, so um, because of some unique aspects of the cluster that we're going to set up. Um, but I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Just know that, uh, that, 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 uh, that you'll be able to follow some of this yourself, uh, but, uh, but things are going to get interesting for us because of the environment that we're running in. So to start, we're going to install the, the common objects, like I said, uh, and, then the, uh, and then the operator. So uh, these are just a series of kubectl commands. So that creates all of the, um, the Kubernetes objects uh, the common Kubernetes objects that Rook is going to need. Then we create the operator, and that's very simple. It's just a single object. Once that operator is running, though, uh, you, can, uh, you can start to see some actions. Uh, there's a, a pod for the operator. Then once that part, pod starts running, um, it starts creating uh, other pods. So you can now see that there's uh, a Ceph agent running. There's going to be an agent for every minion. That's basically the, the operator's agent running on each minion, doing the things that it needs to do behind the scenes uh, with Kubernetes. Uh, and then uh, you can look at the logs for the operator. That's uh, really a key thing um, as, a, as somebody running Rook that you need to know is that whenever, whenever the operator is doing something, it outputs copious and useful logging uh, in the operator pod. So anything, anytime you want to know what's going on, use uh, kubectl logs to, to, to see the logs from that pod. 
So our operator is up and running now. Um, this is where it's going to get weird for us. I'm running this system on a cloud called Vexhost. Uh, and uh, it's, um, I don't work for them. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting paid by them to plug them at all here. Uh, but they, they are a cloud that we enjoy running, um, uh, running things on uh, because they, they're very good at keeping up with uh, upstream OpenStack projects. Um, they're, they're great participants in the community, and, uh, and we talk with them a lot. And because we talk with them a lot, we happen to know uh, an implementation detail about their storage backend. When you ask for a blocked device from OpenStack on the Vexos cloud, you're going to get something that is backed by Ceph. So if you're following along, you might have just realized that this is a talk about deploying a Ceph cluster backed by block storage devices, which are themselves backed by a Ceph cluster. And that might sound weird, but the history of computing is, uh, is about abstraction. And this is the right level of abstraction for us. We don't, we don't really need to care that these block devices are, uh, are managed by Ceph. Uh, but they are, and it's a detail that we can use to our advantage. Um, other than that, they, they behave perfectly normal. They're quite fast. They're reliable. Uh, they're everything that you want in a block device. Um, but because after, the, after all of the layers that they go through to, to end up at our Kubernetes cluster and, uh, and when, Ceph inspects them, when the Ceph agent inspects them, all it sees is a rotational block device. And... Um, we're going to use the blue storage, uh, excuse me, the blue store storage driver, and uh, the blue store driver, when it sees a rotational block device, it, for efficiency's sake, allocates 64 kilobyte chunks. We're going to be running Git repositories on top of this, and Git repositories are characterized by um, a lot of tiny files, and quite oftentimes they're just a few bytes. So we don't want to allocate 64 kilobytes from our underlying block storage device every time uh, just, to, just, to, to, uh, just to deal with this. And because we know that, that we're actually backed by Ceph, um, we, don't, we don't really need to observe this 64 kilobyte uh, limit anymore. Uh, we can actually create um, much smaller block, uh, much smaller allocation units and let the underlying Ceph uh, deal with uh, going, uh, mapping those to the hardware. So um, we're going to set a fairly advanced option here, which is the blue store um, minimum allocation size. And you can see here that by, de uh, by default it's 64 kilobytes um, uh, for rotational de devices and 16 kilobytes uh, otherwise. So for instance, if you're running on an SSD, uh, the allocation unit will be 16K. Um, we, don't, we can actually go even smaller than that. We're going to set it to 4K. Um, uh, because, again, we have a lot of very small files uh, in, in our Git repositories. So to do that, um, uh, Rook provides us an escape valve. You can create um, what's called a config map in Kubernetes, and inside of that config map, you can just uh, stick in uh, basically um, Ceph configuration file format. So you can see there's, uh, in the config uh, stanza of this config map, there's just a little INI file there uh, for configuring the OSD, where we're going to set the blue store minimum allocation size. So uh, if you're, once you get into the point of setting advanced Ceph configuration options, anything that you can do uh, managing a Ceph cluster by hand, you can do with Rook here uh, by, by setting these configuration options. So if we do this early enough in the process before uh, the operator actually creates our cluster, um, when it builds the OSDs, the OSDs will have this configuration file in place already, and, uh, and the initialization of blue store with these values will, will happen automatically. So uh, that's why the next thing we do is to install our custom and configuration file. And again, that's just a kubectl uh, command to create that. And, uh, and that's now installed in Kubernetes, and we're done. So now we can create the Ceph cluster. Creating a Ceph cluster with Rook is, again, just a matter of uh, creating, uh, adding um, objects into Kubernetes. So there's a, uh, uh, a cluster.yaml uh, file here that has all of the, the configuration for our cluster. 
And once that in once that's been added to Kubernetes, um, the Rook operator will see that it's been added, and it'll start to create all of the uh, the, the OSDs and uh, and everything needed to, to actually run the cluster. So you can see here, I'm 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 trying to figure out what's going on here. Uh, I'm I'm looking at the cluster. I'm I'm seeing that there's there's pods uh, being created. Uh, finally, I re remembered that oh, I should I should look at the logs. So here's the logs from the 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 operators, and you can see that it's um, it's bringing up the 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 Ceph cluster one node at a time. It's got one mon device up right now. Uh, then it's bringing up the others. So all of these are uh, Ceph commands um, that you'd need to, to to bring all of the different uh, parts of the Ceph cluster online, and the operator is doing it for you. Um, there's some errors in here. Those are perfectly normal errors. Uh, it's it's the sort of thing where where uh, sometimes you have to run some commands to uh, to see if something exists or not, uh, and uh, but it's okay if it doesn't. So at the end of this, you can see now uh, we have a lot more containers running than before. Uh, in addition, before we had the the agents, uh, now we also have uh, the 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 monitors, the OSDs, uh, and uh, and. Uh, also, actually, there's some initialization containers that were run there. Initialization containers are basically containers that just run once and they're done. So you can see uh, that when the when the when Rook brought the new OSDs online, it uh, it did all of the work to initialize them there. You can check the logs for those, but once those are online, we're done with them. Uh, we don't need them anymore. Uh, so now that we have Rook up and running, we're going to create the file system. Uh, this is uh, another uh, another bit of Kubernetes YAML um, that we that we run, and uh, and again once once this is added into the Kubernetes cluster, the Rook operator sees it and uh, and and creates the Ceph FS file system for it, and. Uh, and if you look at the, the pod listing there, you can see now that there's the metadata storage for the file system uh, containers up and running there. So now that Rook is done, we have a working Ceph cluster. Um, the operator uh, noticed the extra volume that we had attached to each of our minions and, uh, and used that as the backing storage uh, for the Ceph cluster. And we've created our Ceph file system that we're going to use to put the, the Git repositories on. Once all of this uh, is up and running, if you're like me, you'd like to poke at it a little bit, um, and, uh, because all this seems a little bit abstract. So uh, Rook provides something called a toolbox. And that's essentially a container that has all of the, um, all of the common Ceph uh, tools installed already, so you can uh, you can add this toolbox to your to your Kubernetes cluster, and uh, and you'll be able to mount the file system, you run Ceph status commands, um, inspect the cluster, do all kinds of debugging things like that. So uh, in order to get that going, uh, it's one last kube control command to create the the toolbox, uh, and then once we do that. Uh, we can run this listing to see the uh, to see the name of the toolbox pod, and uh, once you do that, you can run uh, you can run uh, kube control exec uh, with a shell to get a shell on it. So here's a shell on the um, on the pod. Uh, in the container, and you can see that we can run uh, kube control, uh, excuse me, Ceph status, uh, and it tells us the status of the Ceph cluster. Uh, Ceph OSD status uh, will show us the, uh, the current storage utilization. So you can see, uh, again, that we've got um, almost all of those 80 gigabyte um, drives that we attach to each of the minions. Almost all of that space is available. Uh, and uh, you can run Ceph DF to show us uh, how much is used by the file system. Nothing yet. Um, so yeah, there, uh, all the all the handy Ceph commands to, to find out what's going on with your cluster are available in the toolbox. Um, 
I'd like to mount the file system, so I make a directory for it. And, uh, and here, uh, here's where I discovered a, a small bug in the Rook README. If you, um, if you run the command as written in the, in the README, it's actually a little bit forward looking. Um, uh, first, you need to, to get the, the, uh, the secrets for the file system. So there are a couple of, uh, we do a, thing, a couple of things to set the, set the, the secrets and then the set endpoints for the file system. Once we have them, uh, we, can, we can run this mount command to mount the file system. Uh, so the, the bug here is that uh, I added the MDS namespace uh, argument to the mount command. Um, the Ceph file system is growing support for multiple namespaces, uh, but we're kind of at this transition period right now in that the kernel version in the toolbox doesn't have support for that yet, so we just need to remove that from the command. Uh, once we do it, uh, it works as expected. So that's going to be fine for us. Our application only needs one, one Ceph file system, uh, one namespace, so we're just going to use that. Um, but uh, but it's exciting that we're, we're entering a new world where, um, where CephFS supports multiple namespaces, which means you can have multiple, essentially multiple file systems all provided by the same Ceph cluster. So we've mounted it. Uh, I've written a file in there, and so it's ready to go. So we've got our shared file system uh, now ready for Gitty. And if you recall, we needed, uh, we needed some more things. We needed the shared database as well. Uh, we're going to use Percona ExtraDB for that. That's, um, uh, that's something that we can manage with uh, some Helm charts and some Ansible playbooks. So we have a playbook to create our, our Percona cluster. And so if we, uh, if we set that up and run it, um, then uh, again, this is, this is just something that you need to do. Uh, all you have to do is give this playbook the, the uh, Kubernetes credentials, uh, and then it will uh, it'll create all of the objects in Kubernetes needed to set up the Perona Extra DB cluster. And at the end of this process, we're going to have uh, a working MySQL uh, uh, replicated MySQL system. And, uh, and the database is all set up and ready to plug in to our application. So our application, uh, again, is Gitty. And so uh, we just need to write some Kubernetes YAML to set that up. So if you, if you look at this, um, it's a little bit longer than this, but I've, I've cut out the boring parts. And, uh, and this is the, the interesting stuff that's applicable to, to what we're talking about here. Um, this is how you how we use the CephFS that we set up before. So um, the, the shared file system, Kubernetes knows about the shared file system as an object. It's using the, the flex storage driver. It's, it's able to know that this file system is a first class object in Kubernetes, and it's backed by Rook and Ceph. So when we specify how to deploy our Gitty application, we say that we're going to create a volume called Gitty Data, and we're going to use that flex volume driver uh, using, um, using the file system that we created earlier, which we called MyFS. So um, this tells Kubernetes that when it, when it creates the, the pods for Gitty uh, to make sure that that volume is available. And uh, down here at the bottom, um, that's how we mount the volume into the Gitty container. So we just say that uh, Gitty data is referencing the volume that we specified right above it, and then the mount path is slash data. So the end result of all of this YAML is that this tells Kubernetes to mount the shared CephFS file system into the Gitty container at slash data. And that's all we need to do in order to use uh, all of this stuff that we've just set up. Um, once more, we have an Ansible playbook uh, that is going to uh, create the application object in Kubernetes. Um, and 
that's going to, to bring up, uh, excuse me, that's gonna bring up Gitty. Uh, and then this playbook is also going to do all of the, uh, uh, everything needed to, to actually uh, bootstrap Gitty itself. So you'll notice here um, that it's set up, uh, there's a task that says set up Gitty service. This is another integration point with OpenStack. So uh, a service in Kubernetes is how you expose an application to the outside world. Um, by default, all of the containers that Kubernetes runs are only accessible within the Kubernetes cluster. The service is going to give us a public IP address. And because we're integrated with OpenStack, it's going to use the Octavia load balancer to create that IP address. So um, in addition to, to creating the, the Gitty pods and application, this playbook also caused um, an Octavia load balancer to be created in OpenStack. And, uh, and then that load balancer has a public IP address and routes internally to the Gitty application pod. So um, actually, before I do this, let me hop over to this tab. So this is what, uh, what our Gitty looks like at the end after everything is, uh, is, um, is set up. So if you go to opendev.org, uh, you'll see this page. And uh, if you click around under uh, Explore, these are all of the, uh, the repositories that we have hosted there, um, coincidentally. A, a change to the Octavia project uh, recently merged, so it's actually at the top of the list. Uh, and so that's what the system looks like with everything up and running. Um, so to sort of wrap things up, this is a free software stack for performing uh, high availability Git hosting. Uh, it's free software from the application um, through the supporting infrastructure, including uh, Kubernetes, Rook, Ceph, uh, through OpenStack all the way to the, the cloud provider underneath. Um, OpenStack has great uh, integration with Kubernetes. It, it provides a lot of services that make using Kubernetes easy. Um, uh, here I showed you uh, Cinder and Octavia, where anytime we, we create a service, we get a, a, a load balancer for free automatically. Um, we get uh, uh, sender block devices whenever we ask for, uh, for an OpenStack volume. And all this stuff is running in Kubernetes because when we're building a shared, uh, a shared everything system like this, Kubernetes is great, especially with operators. Uh, Kubernetes and operators are great for managing these kinds of services. Uh, and if you want to see uh, any of the details of anything that I've shown you here, all of the Ansible playbooks, all of the Kubernetes YAML, uh, everything is, uh, is self-deployed by the system that I showed you here uh, at this URL. It's in the, um, the system config project. So at that URL, you'll be able to browse all of our playbooks, all of our configuration files, uh, everything that we use to continuously deploy the system uh, itself. Uh, and uh, that's all I have. I think we have just a couple of minutes for questions, if anybody has any. Yes, question over here. Um, in this Kubernetes cluster, mm -hmm. um, expose services to OpenStack through Courier, do you know? Um, the question is, can, open, can Kubernetes uh, expose OpenStack services through Courier? Uh, right? The, uh, oh. Uh, so, all right, so I think the question was, <laughs> sorry about this, uh, can, can, uh, can Courier be used to expose OpenStack services through? No. You want to expose Kubernetes services through OpenStack. You want to expose Kubernetes services to an OpenStack tenant through Courier. Um, uh, so uh, I don't have an answer to that question right now. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but uh, Kubernetes is one, uh, uh, one project among many um, that, that perform integrations between OpenStack and, 
and Kubernetes in, in both directions. So there are a number of projects that, that are used for exposing services uh, from one to the other. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, I don't have uh, I don't have the mapping in my head, uh, off the top of my head, for which things are exposed, which way through which project. Um, but I, I, I can help you find the right people to answer that question. Uh, so, uh, yes, it might be a little trouble for me to, to hear you from back there. So, in that link up there, mm -hmm. um, the deployment, the Kubernetes deployment for your for Corona cluster. Mm -hmm is backed by Cinder volumes, um, the Cinder volume plugin for mm -hmm. Kubernetes rather than um, Ceph. Is, right. is there a reason for that, or is it uh, you just haven't gotten to it? Or? Um, right, so the, uh, the, the question was uh, that the, why was the Percona, uh, so the, the Percona cluster is not backed by Ceph, it's just backed by plain Cinder volumes, uh, which are, uh, again, they come from OpenStack. Open um, and, uh, and the question is, why don't we back it by Ceph? And uh, the question, uh, the answer is that at the moment, at least, we, we, we didn't need to. We had a lot on our plate uh, already. And, uh, and that was sort of set up to, uh, um, to, use, uh, to use native Kubernetes volumes. And since we wanted, we wanted the MySQL application service itself to be highly available, um, uh, that meant that we're going to have multiple MySQL nodes anyway, so uh, so we might as well have them uh, each have their own um, their own Cinder device backing the storage. Uh, I'm sure we could back them by Ceph, um, and and I you know it might be something that we that we look at more when we uh, as this sort of as this evolves. But that was um, that was easy to set up as it was, and uh, and it. It met our HA needs. And I think, uh, I think we're at time. So thank you very much.